Hello everyone. Um, my name is Celeste Matros and I'm from the Center for of Violence and Reconciliation. I just wish to welcome you to the final webinar in CSVR's blended symposium. I'm sorry, I'm just getting feedback from the French channel. Um, yeah, so just to welcome everyone uh, to the final webinar, I know how busy everyone is and how difficult it can be to attend this. And we are incredibly grateful that you did. Just to let everyone know, um, there is Arabic, Swahili, and Zulu interpretation available. Click on the interpretation button and select your preferred language. For today, our hope is that in addition to the panelists, remarks, we are able to hear more from you and her, hope to learn from your experiences. Oh, there's a person living in a traumatized world and as one doing the work of contributing towards making it a better place to live in. In terms of background, the Splendid Voices journey did not begin with the first webinar in October. Neither, neither did it begin with the first planning meeting in 2019, where we decided as an organization that this brainchild of senior pollution, Mayor Mohammed, was something that we wanted to implement. Like all good stories and good journeys, the true beginning cannot be exactly pinpointed. Rather, the start of this journey like all others, is an amalgamation of many intersecting journeys and pathways belonging to many actors over many years until we reach this point, which is just one small moment within a larger, grander story of the continent, its pain, and its healing. However, like all movements, the work that we are all doing and have done together, both within this webinar series and without, are small incremental steps towards achieving our ultimate shared goal of a healed, thriving Africa and a healed, thriving planet. We cannot undo what has happened to us, but we can integrate and use it to take the type of people, family, community, society, country, region, continent, and planet that we want to create. And hopefully, that is a resilient, healthy, thriving, peaceful entity that is free from violence. We also need to remember the gift that our ancestors gave us, and not just the trauma, to paraphrase a quote that I saw on Facebook posted by the page Black and Gold Poetry, if every focus on cleaning your generational trauma, do not forget to claim your generational strength. Your ancestors gave you more than just wounds. And it is this balanced reflection that I encourage us to make So often we focus on the challenges, what went wrong, that we missed the successes and what went right. And we need to celebrate these, especially since the work that we do can be incredibly painful and incredibly exhausting. Focusing now on this particular part of the story, the Blended Voices Symposium arose out of the work being done on torture, war trauma, and violence throughout the continent and was motivated by interventions being conducted to support these issues. 
From the outset, the symposium aimed to call on African voices to speak to narratives of trauma, healing, and resilience. CSVR hired an external consultant to provide a reflective evaluation of the symposium series. As part of today's introduction, I'll be taking us through a catch-up session where I'll be reading excerpts from that report. CSVR would like to thank Tasneem van der Basin for a thoughtful and exciting report, which generated lots of conversations and discussions within CSVR, and I'm sure it will do the same for you. We will be emailing um, the report as well as other material later this year, once we have finalized um, their copy editing and their layout. The summary will be done using a graphic recording created for us by Sonia Nida Yuma from Graphic Harvest, which depicts the five previous webinars. I will write Sonia's email address in the chat for those of you who are interested in her work. Sonia is here today and you may see her, her camera is on and she's busy drawing away as we're speaking. At the end um, of today's webinar, she will be sharing with us the draft um, infographic. And we will share that final graphic as long as, as well as the others with all of you later on this year, where we will also be sh uh, sharing other knowledge products and other exciting um, you know, platforms and webinars that are coming up during the year. But before we go on to the summary, I'm just gonna hand over to Amina, who's going to just take us through um, some technical points, logistics, uh, and the importance of using the Q&A and the chat as a means um, of increasing participation. Amina, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone from South Africa. My name is Amina Moikambo, and um, this is just going to be a few of the um, logistical stuff in order for us to be able to work through this webinar. We do have a lot of panelists today, and we invite all of the um, attendees or participants to also participate in the conversation today. So we will have three panels and in the three panels, everybody who will be participating and discussing will have their, their microphones and their videos on. But if you are an attendee and you'd like to participate in the conversation, please may you drop your questions or your comments in the comments section. If there is something that you would like to share, but um, need to share it verbally, you can raise your hand and we will give you the opportunity to also participate in that way. We have two hashtags that we've been using to run through the symposium. It's hashtag MHPSS in Africa and hashtag towards healing Africa. If you are going to tweet or post on Facebook, please use those hashtags as well so that we can follow the conversation. Um, CSVR has a Twitter account, which is at underscore CSVR and Facebook, which is the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. If there's anybody you know who'd still like to join in our webinar today, they can follow the page and we are live streaming on there. And we also have an Instagram page, which is the CSVR. As Celeste mentioned, we have interpretation as well in Zulu, French, Arabic and Swahili, you can just click on the interpretation icon at the bottom, and then you can mute original language so that you're able to then hear the, um, the, the conversation in your language. We are so excited to continue with this conversation in our last webinar. Thank you so much, Celeste. Thanks, Amina. Okay, so back to the story. Um, of our journey as fellow blended voices, uh, symposium travelers. For the purpose of simplicity, let's just say that the part of the journey that we have been on together began in October 2020 with the very first webinar entitled A History of Trauma and Torture on Our Continent. Where, as stated in the reflection report by Tasneem van der Beisen, it became immediately clear that this was to be a space in which the terrors that the African continent has been exposed to would be dealt with in an honest, 
transparent, yet sensitive, safe, and reflective way. And this was very important to us as the planning team of the symposium. We recognized how sanitized the history of Africa had become, how stripped of emotion its retelling now was, if it was told at all. And we wanted to try and put back the focus on the human experience, raising the awareness that real people, real communities had experienced these horrors, these atrocities, huge complex losses was important. These were not fairy tales or dry facts that you had to learn to pass your history test or win a general knowledge competition. These were the lived experiences of people from all over the continent. Well, those of us attending today may be also aware of that fact. And let's hope that as we share various materials and knowledge products generated out of the symposium, we may remind others of that fact. People who may have forgotten it in the middle of reading international laws, the creation of peace agreements, the political jostling that takes place on the continent, and introduce that knowledge to those who are unaware of our continent's history, as well as its current traumas. Tazneem continues in her report that this webinar leaves one with a more holistic understanding of the extreme width, breadth, and depth of trauma and torture on the continent but also the ways in which these atrocities have contributed to the state of Africa and her people in more ways than just mental health. A personal part of this webinar was a presentation on woundedness, which presented a rethinking of trauma and its effects. In insisting on trauma being understood in a collective way, as is necessary in order for all its effects to be fully appreciated, the use of the word woundedness offers an important way in which African and grassroots understanding of trauma can be adopted into clinical etymology. The term comes from the course and understanding of trauma being a wound of the heart. One could extrapolate that the usefulness of this definition is that it allows for the effects of trauma to be understood as more than just a list of prescriptive and approved symptoms, but rather a marked impression left within an individual and a system. In the second webinar, we attempted to tackle the issue of repetitive cycles of violence. This webinar offered insights and critiques into some of the conundrums and stumbling blocks often faced when doing this work, particularly when sitting with the gravity of the effects of trauma and the longevity of violence and trauma across time. It highlighted how we are often left with more questions than answers. A key observation was that trauma is not just epigenetically passed down over generations, but is also intergenerationally shared through language, storytelling, and works of memory. And so the trauma is inlaid across generations in multiple ways and re-performed generation after generation. I am reminded of something that Dr. Babu said in webinar five, uh, and I'm gonna paraphrase it here. He said, how can we tell the stories of Africa in a way that we pass on the lessons and not the trauma? This is such an important point as we do not ourselves want to be trauma carriers, but rather peace carriers to quote CSVR ED Nomfundo Mohabi. The third webinar looked at the ways in which torture and trauma can be rehabilitated in Africa. As was queried up front, how do conversations by African people influence the narrative of violence on the continent so as to facilitate healing? This webinar in particular aimed to offer reflections on the ways in which violence and transgenerational trauma can be disrupted so that rehabilitation strategies could be offered at multiple levels with the aim of collective healing. Key takeaways from this webinar included the utility of traditional mental health methods of diagnosis and understanding. And that in an attempt to integrate indigenous ways of knowing, we do not need to proverbially throw out the baby with the bath water. We can integrate our clinical expertise into our indigenous, cultural, spiritual ways of healing. And we must also caution ourselves to hand over 
all current ways of healing as the years or Western, as if we have not contributed to that knowledge or community of practice. This webinar restated the importance of psychotherapeutic work and its understandings and its necessity in healing and helping, uh, helping individuals, which has a place because less broken people helps the collective. In addition, by trying to engage alternative ways of healing, whilst the healing may not be journaled or documented in conventional and traditionally Western ways, the healing is real uh, nonetheless for that person who's gone through that journey. And this healing has a place in the world and certainly within Africa. This left one with questions around um, replicability and dissemination. How do we reproduce this? How do we teach this? The fourth webinar looked at the ways in which collective trauma can be engaged with in post-conflict situations. The panelists presented their research and findings into the ways in which their various interventions are making progress in peace building and healing across the continent. And that despite the various roadblocks and challenges, the work continues. An analogy that was useful throughout the webinar was that of the cracked cup. That despite the cup looking intact, there are deep rooted cracks that have been caused by violence and then further proliferated by systemic issues. As was usefully demonstrated, trauma in and of itself does not cause the cracks, but rather trauma is what prevents the cracks from being repaired. The symposium has thus far shown this over and over again in exploring the prevalence and pervasiveness of trauma across space and time, and the ways in which it is produced and reproduced in so many spaces. The analogy of the crack cup sits with one because it concretely demonstrates the inability of a crack cup to be a useful and effective vessel. With the cracks, it simply cannot be a productive entity. This is usually something that we would just discard. But through the work presented in this webinar, the first glimmer, glimmers of hopefulness emerge in seeing the ways in which repair is possible. And lastly, the fifth webinar looked at unpacking mental health in Africa. The webinar allowed for African mental health workers to define and reflect on mental health on the continent. This webinar looks at how pervasively mental health services continue to be under-resourced on the continent, yet due to high demands for care, is also simultaneously oversubscribed. The panelists demonstrated the ways in which healthcare pr practitioners, institutions and organizations attempt to fill these gaps and suggestions are offered as to how research, advocacy, treatment and empowerment strategies can allow for the creation of a new way of thinking, engaging and co-creating a way forward. So in summary, over the course of the symposium, it was shown that trauma cannot be understood in an insular, siloed or solely individualized way, as the violations happen in and across collectives. Yet there is the ever persistent, ever persistent insistence to treat trauma and its effects with an individual treatment model. Throughout the webinar series, it was clearly and consistently outlined that trauma is not an individual battle, but rather a historically systemic and widespread concern. By delineating the various levels of trauma, as well as a multi-layered and ecological way in which politics has shifted the trauma landscape, one could not miss the ways in which trauma affects all people, from the individual to the collective across time and space. As one panelist noted, in Kenya, there have always been traditional understandings that there is no separation between health and connection, and the word for ill health means disconnection. According to this panelist, that it is implicit even in the language that health was never just about individual care, but required systemic and collective thinking. I love this idea that health is connection, but I'm also sitting with the thought that if those connections are damaging or unsafe, then ill health is also a result. Again, as I said earlier, we need to ensure that through our connections, our ways of relating, our relationships, we do not pass on trauma, hurt or harm onto others. Another panelist noted, the trauma work being done currently 
is like changing the wheel of the vehicle while the vehicle is still running. With this in mind, while it's well-intentioned, is it possible, let alone effective, to do this work in such a way? In holding the aforementioned understanding of trauma as a multidimensional concept, the symposium further highlighted the fundamental respect for context that is needed in order for any successful healing to be achieved. Uniformly, all panelists indicated that no singular solution exists. And should a framework come to be, that would be all encompassing, no one solution could even then be applied in a blanketed way. One panelist specifically noted that there is no way to find a singular, normative, and generalized way of being, but we could perhaps think towards a framework that could be customized for context. This is a message that has been consistent throughout the symposium and is necessary to hold at all levels of thinking and understanding of trauma and its effects. The utilization of an Afrocentric lens was also pivotal to the aim of the symposium and throughout the series. Ways of knowing, learning and healing from an African perspective was prioritized. In order for healing to happen, respect has to be granted to grassroots endeavors, interventions and indigenous and African ways of knowing and healing. Two other key things were those of power and accountability and the role that they play as barriers to healing. These were quite complex discussions and in the interest of time, I will not speak to them here other than to highlight one aspect of power that was discussed by one of the panelists who spoke to the ways in which governments have traditionally used power to curtail the messages of hope and inspiration that is spread in creative means, such as through art and storytelling. An important quote by Ben Okri highlights this, and I quote, to poison a nation, poison its stories. A demoralized nation tells demoralized stories to itself. Therefore, plant stories in the ears of your children. It is the predominant stories that shape our psychology. This beautifully brings together individuals in context in Africa. That we are not autonomous, vacuous entities. We are made up of the narratives and stories around us. They are part of us. So in Africa, where the predominant stories are stories of suffering, poverty, warfare, and trauma, how do we begin to look forward in recreating the stories we share and reproduce? One last powerful note from the report that resonated with me was a keen sense that the apparent and obvious victims are not the only ones requiring healing. That even though the direct effects of torture and violence may be on specific people, the collateral damage is far wider than initially understood. It is imperative to know this history in order to even begin envisioning the potential for healing. In addition, as activists, human rights defenders, mental health and psychosocial support practitioners, civil society actors, legal practitioners, journalists, and others working on violence prevention, peace building, trauma and torture rehabilitation, and other human rights issues, we too are often victims ourselves through our own personal trauma histories as member of a particular society experiencing violence and its effects, and also through our work. Tasneem asks, what is the toll of this work? Who is holding our healers? She continues, one panelist commented on the multiplicity of the roles that agents of this work have to own. That at CSVR, there are many psychologized lawyers and lawyerized psychologists. This once again leaves one with thoughts about the complexity of what it takes to be a professional working in these areas. There is no neatness and role clarity. There's no avoidance of responsibility. In order to grapple with the realities and complexities of the work, multiple hats need to be worn at all times. And one would be remiss to not talk to the responsibility that then is once again heaped onto mere mortals. And again, she asks, who is caring for these carers? I'll leave you with that thought as I hand over to Mariki Mirafe to moderate our first panel entitled a History of Torture, Trauma, and Violence in Africa, Past and Present. Moriyehi Mirafe is currently working as a senior community practitioner within the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Program 
at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. He has worked mainly with, with among others, South African ex-combatants, victims of violence, and youth at risk. His work has been conducted in different communities where he provided capacity building in the prevention of violence, as well as short-term counseling, focusing on gender-based violence, state-sponsored violence, youth violence, collective violence, and peace building. Over to you, Morihi. My apologies, I was speaking to myself. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you once more uh, for joining us in our sixth day and last day symposium themed, connected, diverse, powerful, sounding the call for a healed Africa. In this session, we are going to reflect on a number of questions in an effort to unpack a history of torture, trauma, and violence in Africa, past and present. And we ask these questions amidst the unrelenting assertions by some that Africa is forever stuck in the past, that she is stubbornly refusing to move on. And we hope that we will all learn or benefit from these uh, discussions. Now, just as a reminder to all that we have uh, 40 minutes only, for this session and I would like to plead with our distinguished panelists and all those who will be contributing to the discussions to be prudent with, with time. And before we commence with our reflections and because of time constraints, as I mentioned, may I just briefly introduce our esteemed panelists in no particular order. And apologies if I do not pronounce your name correctly. Uh, we have Jaida Haji, who is a PhD candidate at the University of the Witwatersrand, Rand. And she is of Moroccan heritage and a Muslim from France. She focuses mainly on questions related to racism, love, youth, identity, and repar repar reparations. And then we have Ten Tendaisha Klo. I think earlier on we had a problem with his connectivity, but is, if, he, if he's with us, uh, Tendaishe um, works as the transitional justice advocacy specialist for the National Transitional Justice Working Group based in Harare, Zimbabwe. He has uh, published over 30 articles. Next, we have uh, Stephen Ribello who is a counseling psychologist and a senior researcher at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. Last but not least, we have Karis Moses Oteba, who is a protection officer and well-being lead, promoting self-care and effective stress management amongst human rights defenders, and is based in Uganda. He is highly skilled and experienced in the use of expressive arts in stress and trauma therapy. Now to kickstart our discussions, we'll firstly focus on woundedness by asking the following questions. And these questions are to our panelists and everybody else who would, if time permits, would want to contribute to the discussions. What is the cost to all of us when we are walking around with a degree of woundedness? How can we address this woundedness, especially when those in leadership have been victims of trauma and serve from a place of woundedness in power systems that impact on the lives of all those who are within their ecosystem and ultimately leading to further wounding? I'm not so sure if you want me to repeat the question. The question is, what is the cost to all of us when we are walking around with a degree of woundedness? How can we address this woundedness? Especially when in leadership, 
we have victims of trauma and serve from a place of woundedness in power systems that impact on the lives of all those who are within their ecosystem and ultimately leading to further wounding. Uh, who wants to go first? Amongst the, our panelists. Was the question clear? We have uh, Jaida Haji, Tendai Sheto, Stephen Rebello, and Karis Moses Oteba. I don't mind going first. <laughs> Thank you, Jaida. Thank you very much, Modigi, for this introduction. So um, I'm going to, uh, I hope you, hear, you can hear me well. Um, no. I'm going to talk about woundedness, power, violence, and healing the self. And I will not specifically focus on one question, but what I'm going to say is going to address some of the questions. And I'm going to talk about three points. Uh, and uh, my um, intervention today is based on uh, Mangani's book called Being Black in the World and published in 1973. So the first point. So according to Mangani, Africa has been imposed white cultural values in terms of individualism, which implies a certain materialism which are based on capitalism. This system of values goes against um, African values that are very different because they are related to community, which implies a sharing system. Sorry, here we go. Uh, the capitalist system in which we live today does not help to heal Africa to address the trauma by going back to and promoting African values. Wounded leaders may want to heal through this system, through capitalism, through this individualistic and materialistic system, which may be beneficial in a short term for themselves, but not in a long term for their country, for the community, for the continent they may create further wounding. Now my second point. Those, it means that we need an economic change. And um, another argument for that is that one of the deepest trauma in Africa is the trauma of poverty. So we can't heal, we can't go forward without addressing um, the economic aspect. And we need an economic change. Um, being heard, because we talked like through different, um, to the former um, conferences, we talked about dialogue, um, the importance of uh, sharing, of being heard, of hearing, but we can't being heard if there is no, um, if there is no concrete change, such as economic changes. Mangani says that we need a solidarity. We need we need to share in order to heal. These values require to become responsible. Our economy needs to be responsible. The pandemic and, uh, the, and the phenomenon of climate change are actually both helping us to become more responsible. And I guess this is a positive side of this phenomenon. The idea of what we can hear, for example, in our time, the idea of uh, shopping and supporting local products, um, promoting natural products over products made of chemicals or plastic, help us to become more responsible and to support our community. It helps us to make an economic change that are more aligned with African values. The economic market needs to become responsible and aligned with African values, as I said. And now my last point, which is actually just questions that I'm, um, that I'm asking myself, actually. Um, what is the place of African Union 
in relation to healing, to this economic change. Um, for, um, in my experience is that I hear um, very positive stories uh, and positive stories based on economic change through uh, the channel CNN Africa, through um, Al Jazeera, through uh, France 24, but I don't hear anything positive in terms of economic change through the African Union. The only, um, I mean, this is my experience. The only things I hear from uh, this organization that represent our continent is political conflict, negativity, which may deepen our trauma. So how can the self-esteem of a continent heal when the organization representing it mostly highlights negativity such as conflicts? And how can the African Union promote a responsible economic system of development? So yeah, so this is the end. I don't know if I was clear, I hope I was clear. But uh, yeah, well, I wanted to end with just questions that I'm wondering about. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Jaida, uh, for your enlightening response. And we note that the, the core of your, of your response is African humanism. I'm not so sure if there's anyone who wants to add from the panel before we move on. Any comment? Yes, I'll come through. Thank you, Karis. Yes, thank you, Modege. Uh, The, the, the whole concept of woundedness uh, from the previous webinar, earlier presentation, diagnosis of, of what our, uh, we are uh, wounded. And I think the first positive step towards our healing is, uh, you know, forums like this. And, and for that matter, I want to thank uh, CSVR uh, for, 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 for even thinking about, about putting this together. This is good uh, for, for, for us as a, as a way of, of, of moving forward as a continent. Um, correct diagnosis, so I'm not going we have uh, an agreed diagnosis. Africa is a wounded continent, and not just the victims of, uh, of the subjects, but also our leaders are wounded. What does this mean for us as a continent? Uh, a wounded person uh, tends to, to, to injure others, tends to, you know, there is a, a, a human comfort in. knowing that others are feeling the same pain, it's, it's saddest of sorts. But you see, uh, it, it, it only uh, pins down the fact that when we are wounding, when we are hurting, we sometimes unconsciously or subconsciously tend to hurt uh, others. And uh, because of this woundedness and our own um, move to sort of find a healing, to sort of satisfy our own gaps, our own to 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 cover up for our own wounds. Sometimes we do uh, things that cause others hurt. It manifests in our leadership on the continent through operation of of of, uh, of other sections of of society and community. Uh, so the cost, the very first cost. Of, of woundedness to us as a continent is oppression of the weak by those that are stronger, by those that have power. Uh, um, the, 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 the second cost of, of, of uh, woundedness to us as a continent, I would say, is that uh, a lot of potential has been destroyed and, 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 and destinies of many individual uh, persons and, and communities have been killed 
you know, they've been completely mess. Uh, you know, those that have power seek to maintain this power again from a capitalist tendency, because uh, power and, and wealth are uh, have been associated. You know, he who has power controls the means in Africa. And so to maintain this posture, uh, they have to deal with perceived enemies, deal away with perceived enemies or keep them poor so you can continue ruling over them. And, 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 and in this way, a lot of, of destinies, a lot of potential is buried. That the other thing that uh, I want to say as a cost to us as a continent is lives have been lost as a result of, mm. again, this, this same woundedness, uh, a lot of lives uh, have been lost. I will come back on, on the other question. So that's my contribution. Yes. On, Thank you so very on, on much. Uh, first question. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're moving on and now we're focusing on the next uh, uh, theme, uh, which is a trauma escalation. Now here, we want to know why is trauma only noted when the distress is unmanageable and the fall out too much to bear. Should we not be thinking about intervening much earlier? And what would early intervention look like? Why is trauma only noted when the distress is unmanageable and the fall out too much to bear? Should we not be thinking about intervening much earlier? And what would early interventions look like. Hi, Bob Maria here. If I can maybe jump in on this one. I think linked to what uh, Jada said and what, what Karis also mentioned is, uh, I was thinking to myself, it might be important to ask who, who sees trauma. Um, you know, for, for those who are making important political decisions, developing policies, for those who are in power, do they see trauma or is it us as ourselves, as people involved in mental health, is that what, you know, what we see? So I think it, it might be important for us to, to ask what, what do they see uh, when there is this fallout, when, when things seem to be chaotic or, you know, there's a lot of stress happening in a, in a country. Um, you know, what do those who are in power see? And maybe, you know, how do we, we kind of shift that? And for me, I think part of the, of, of trying to change like the narratives or, or what people see is, is kind of linked to trying to, you know, raise this awareness like we, we're doing here, but taking these conversations, you know, into more, more public spaces, you know, using, I think, social media more effectively uh, as CSVR, I think we can also do that better is, um, you know, I think as NGOs, many of us, we, we could have more sustained um, social media plans and strategies and, and reach, uh, for example, more young people and to reach more, more of the general uh, population, I think. Um, yeah, so I think for me, that's, that's what I would like to just add quickly is um, maybe those in power, those who are making decisions don't see trauma. And how do we get them to, to perhaps see that? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Steve. Uh, anyone, any addition, any comment? The tragedy of it all is- okay. As if I may Thanks, add uh, on this as well. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, quickly. Uh, um, I would like to agree with Stephen and uh, add that uh, because of our history as a continent and also the social construct, the social dynamics, which are largely patriarchal, uh, the whole concept of uh, trauma, the whole concept of, uh, of, of, of torture has sort of been normalized so much so that uh, uh, it's, it's, people are ignorant. First, a lot of people do not even know that they are traumatized. How are they going to, uh, you know, get healed if they don't know in the first place that 
the, 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 the societal norms, our African social norms sort of um, promote, they, they sort of engender a certain, a certain power stratification where through violence, I mean, woundedness as a, as a result of, of, of violence, people accept violence and it passes unnoticed. It, it, it goes unnoticed. So I think the levels of ignorance about uh, our level of woundedness, about the amount of trauma that we are going through is at the early stages, but only when it is overly escalated and it's, it's, uh, it's it become it has become more complex. That is when uh, we notice. In terms of um, uh, ignorance, create more awareness, just like Steve has said. Maybe go out there full, full blown, talk about these issues and uh, point them out. Help open up the eyes of everybody to see uh, where we are at and, and the need that there is for healing. Thank you so very much. Uh, is it Karis? Um, now, aware that being aware that we uh, time is not on our side, we move on to the next uh, question. And here we're focusing on power and violence. How do we fully grasp aspects of power and its role in perpetuating violence, particularly related to capitalism and structural elements? that maintain levels of inequality and feed into structural violence? How do we fully grasp aspects of power and its role in perpetuating violence, particularly related to capitalism and structural elements that maintain levels of inequality and feed into structural violence? That is our question. Uh, our panelists, panelists from other sessions, perhaps if you want to give an input. Okay. Uh, I want to, to define what capitalism is. Uh, capital is an economic and political system uh, individuals, private ownership of, prop, of, 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 uh, of resources as opposed to, you know, uh, more uh, as opposed to, 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 to the public ownership and co co uh, the communism uh, uh, um, ideology that more, you know, it belongs to us all. And now, mm -hmm. power, like I earlier said, is associated with control of resources. And uh, how this plays out is that, uh, you know, to be in charge of the resources, you need to be in power. And uh, to maintain control of the resources, uh, you need to stay in power. What does this mean? Uh, for those who believe that, uh, you know, wealth is the answer to everything in life, they will scramble. To get to positions of power, and that's what that's what is happening in most of Africa. People are running to positions of authority, to positions of political power. Not so much so. Uh, because they want to, you know, give back or to provide leadership uh, for 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 the good of everybody, but more for their own selfish and they use the same power to maintain themselves in power and so at all costs now elections in africa have become a do or die thing simply because people want to maintain that control over the resources for themselves not for the benefit of everybody uh that, that our fallen uh, you know the president of tanzania the former president is largely praised for, for, for sort of gearing things. Uh, 
Um, we seem to be having connectivity challenges. Uh, Away from everybody else in the continent seems to have been doing. Uh, that's uh, Um, I'm not so sure if we, it's from my side, yeah, but we, we're having a problem. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure also if it is from my side, well, maybe I'll just wrap it up. If the others are hearing, good. Yes, Probably please. Sonia can, yes. can capture it. So I was saying, that uh, uh, a place where those in power are seeking to maintain power. It is, it's created a social stra a socioeconomic stratification of, of masters and serfs, you know? It's created classes of those who have and those who do not have. And uh, those who have the power and the means are constantly, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, disadvantaging those who have not the power. That's it from me. Thank you very much uh, um, for your input and thanks to Karis uh, Moses and, and Steve uh, Ribello. Um, <clears throat> We, we, we now move to the next theme in the interest of time. And like we said that, you know, there will be accusations that Africa is living in the past. We don't want to, to move on. So we want to know how are we going to be able to heal the, 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 the esteem of our continent that has been broken down by years of colonization, conflict, and war as well as propaganda uh, of uh, quote unquote, the dark continent. There is this narrative about the dark continent. How do we heal the esteem of our continent that has been broken down by years of colonization, conflict and war, as well as the propaganda of quote unquote, the dark continent. I would like to to respond. Um, I think it needs to go through um, two different um, uh, at two different levels. At the micro level, by uh, uh, like Carrie said earlier, through awareness, through um, dialogue, by sharing story, uh, through certain solidarity, and at the macro level through um, by changing the system, which is uh, not an easy task um, and which um, I mean, big organization such as, as I said earlier, the African Union has a huge responsibility um, in this regard. So I think it should happen at both levels, the micro level and the macro level. Um, and also at the political and economic and psychological level. So, which makes it very complex, very, very complex. Um, but yeah, this is, this is myself about it. Thank you, Jaida. And perhaps as a follow-up question, um, holding the complex histories explored, one is left with a deep sense of grief and loss that the violence on the continent has caused. Is mourning therefore not also a part of the healing that is needed? And if so, how does the whole continent grieve? Is mourning therefore not also a part of the healing that is needed? And if so, how does the whole continent grieve?
Is the question clear? I see Brother Stevo, you, you, you ready to go? Yeah, I, I, my hope is that we can we can bring uh, the other panelists and participants into into that that conversation. Mm -hmm. But for me, just a point earlier from what for from what Jada mentioned is is maybe to for us to consider you know what the different aspects of healing and the different aspects of of justice. Um, you know, I, I think from from our backgrounds, for me especially as a psychologist, we look at that intrapsychic kind of level, but hopefully. Uh, like Jada mentioned, is you know uh, we I, th I think as a continent need to, to to do more in supporting each other, but also holding you know heads of states and others accountable. Uh, I, do, I do see some positives like with African Union, different uh, you know free trade agreements and more like regional trade and stuff that's happening. But I do think that we we need more accountability. Um, you know we need these regional bodies to to be setting the bar uh, for leadership uh, but also yeah to have those conversations around healing and justice and and to just keep those conversations going thank you steve and jada and can i also read from uh, um one of the, the attendees here uh, she says a useful technique in healing centered education and or restorative centered education is needed in africa not turning away from our history, not blaming other, but creating a space to acknowledge our history, hear each other and come together to move forward from where we are now. Thank you so very much for your input. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that the time is not on our side. And okay, can I say um, just briefly, uh, Moses, you can be brief, yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, three points to contribute to this. Uh, one, with a broken esteem, I think it needs restoration. And one of the ways is through education, restorative set of education, like uh, that, that uh, colleague out there has said. I also think that we need to change the narrative. How about paint uh, the brighter side of Africa through full-fledged media campaigns, uh, you know, promotion of, 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 of the African culture, fashion, and you know, uh, uh, the arts and all of this. That, uh, there is a, a Coca-Cola advert that ran a few years ago. It was painting the brighter side side of Africa, how about we deliberately uh, go out pushing for a, a better picture, change the narrative about Africa. The Western media particularly does a lot in injuring the East, the East of Africa. Just a few days ago, uh, uh, one very prominent international, you know, uh, uh, print media said a very derogative, you know, publish a very derogative headline about uh, the first female president of, of, of East Africa. I thought it was uncalled for. How about we push back uh, uh, changing the narrative by highlighting the brighter side? Let's approach the whole, you know, psychological healing uh, and uh, that, that process more from uh, um, culturally appropriate, you know, forms of therapy. I will propose uh, the expressive arts therapy, for instance, music, the dance, poetry, storytelling, these resonate more with Africa as constants. There are more there there are uh, inter with uh, also that the, 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 the um, with the African cultures. Morning. We used to have dances for morning. We used to have, uh, you, know, you know, dances for celebration, for marriage, and for all forms of culturally accepted uh, ways of ex of self-expression in therapy, in healing, uh, in psycho healing and psychotherapy. And then, lastly, I will agree with Stephen on holding our leadership accountable. I think we need to do more peaceful advocacy and, and activism. Uh, in the line of holding uh, Africa's leadership 
accountable in as far as you know perpet per, per, uh, perpetration of 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 of, of torture trauma violence is, is concerned and also in as far as you know selling the positive image of Africa out there Rwanda is, is is doing quite a good job their president is deliberate on marketing a positive image about Africa and pushing back on the negative vibe and rhetoric that is 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 thrown is thrown at the continent yeah I would like to to add something if I can you can go, yes. Um, like Carrie said, uh, I completely agree with you. The narrative is very important. And um, actually, my experience showed me that uh, grand narratives are not necessarily true. Um, my experience in, in France and my experience in South Africa showed me that um, um, in opposition to the grand narrative that the North is ahead and is forward is completely it's completely untrue. Um, I saw many things that are that we can all consider as as forward, as being ahead in South Africa, um, in many, many, many um, different um, different domains, different field, the economic field, uh, at university, um, and I mean, yeah, grand narrative may actually it's it's necessary to just highlight the truth. I think about Africa, because grand narratives are are completely untrue, actually. So yeah, that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Jaida and Paris. Uh, we we have a few minutes left, and I think there is a question uh, from the one of the participants is around and it's around gender-based violence. I think we, we have only three, three minutes or so to, 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 to tackle this question. The, the, the question is, uh, gender-based violence is, in South Africa is very high. Women and children are going through trauma of uh, the, in the way cases are being handled. They take years before cases are started women and children are battling with their healing. And issuing of DNA test results take years. And as we speak, there is some talk about lack of capacity to do these tests. What is it exactly that can be done to protect women, children, and people with disabilities? We have about three minutes to, to deal with this one. And uh, I think anyone can, can contribute. Um, participants in the room. We are aware of the high levels of gender-based violence in our country. And at the receiving end of this very cruel violence is women and children in the main. So what is it exactly that can be done to protect women, children, and people with disabilities? We have I think, Yes, and thank you, Suzanne. I think, you know, seeing gender-based violence, can you can see it from a system level and you can see it from an individual level. Um, and, you know, we, from a program level, um, there's strategies around working in gender-based violence. But to take it back up to a bigger system level, we often see, because of these cycles of violence, the manifestation um, and the impacts of violence on the collective can be things like child abuse and gender-based violence. So bringing in what everyone has said so far already today, if there were more efforts in restructuring economies and leadership um, and breaking these cycles of violence, we wouldn't have this symptom, this outcome at the end, which is gender-based violence. So it's a really big question to ask, but um, depending on which level you take it to, I think your answer is quite different. 
but if you take it back to that system level um, and healing historical traumas and breaking the bigger cycles of violence, restructuring um, our countries and nations, it would, it would go a long way to, to minimize that or we wouldn't see those outcomes as much. Thank you so very much, uh, Susan. Uh, and isn't it the, the best and the nice way to take the button and give it to you, pass it to you, Susan, uh, as you were responding to that question. The next session, and I think we, we finished ours on time. Uh, I take this, uh, is it the Celeste and then we'll... Okay. Back to you, Celeste. Thanks, Mariyuki. Thanks to everyone for a very exciting panel. Um, I love the multi-level discussions. I love the how systems and ecology are just, and power and politics are all wrapped together. Um, so now I just wanna hand over to Susan Wyatt from Terra Consulting to moderate our next session, uh, Torture and Trauma Rehabilitation in Africa individual and collective healing approaches. Occupational therapist Susan Wyatt is an expert in transcultural mental health and community-based trauma healing with an international career spanning Australia, the Great Lakes region in Africa and Zimbabwe. She has contributed to the nexus between clinical mental health and peace building with recent publications for the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum and the Trauma Research Foundation. Susan is due to complete her Master's in Anthropology and Development in 2021, focusing on conflict and development. Her career includes over 12 years of practice in specialist services, such as the Torch and Trauma Forum and an in international portfolio development for NGOs. She also worked as a senior clinician in government, developing national level multicultural mental health frameworks and policies. Susan is now based in Zimbabwe, working as an independent psychotherapist trainer and development consultant with local and international groups, providing strategic navigation, capacity building, and technical backstopping. Thank you so much for being here, Susan, uh, and over to you. Thank you so much, Celeste. Um, thank you, CSBR, for holding this very, very important forum. Um, it's been really inspiring, and thank you to the last theme. I'm feeling invigorated, ready to go. I'm, I'm ready to take on this challenge of changing the narratives and, and showing the world who we really are in Africa, um, rather than you know, what's been seen in the medias. So I have a really fantastic panel here today. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll just introduce each one um, and read you their bios. And then I will direct questions to each one. Um, but that doesn't mean that others can't answer. And as people have said before, if you have something you really want to say and contribute, please also add it to the chat. People can read and engage with it there. Um, suggestions for resources or links or important um, people to read about, please do add it to the chat. So um, to start with, we have Sumeya. So Sumeya holds a master's degree in community-based counseling psychology and she currently works as a senior psychosocial trauma professional at CSVR. Samaya is an advocate for mental health. Her research interests include exploring the systematic impact of trauma and understanding expressions of mental health and rehabilitation in relation to social contexts. So welcome Samaya. We then have Charlotte. So Charlotte is a social worker with an honors degree in social work and is currently working as a junior psychosocial trauma professional with CSVR. Her interests are focused on providing trauma-informed mental health and psychosocial services to individuals, groups, and communities, as well as the integration of contextually relevant mental health and psychosocial support interventions within processes of rehabilitation from human rights violations. She's also interested in child and youth trauma-informed interventions that seek to address issues of transgenerational transmissions of trauma. Welcome, Charlotte. We then have Dr. Angie Yoda-Maina. So Dr. Angie 
She is the executive director of a local Kenyan NGO called the Green String Network. Um, it's work, she works regionally on healing cycles of violence through a healing-centered peace-building approach. The Green String Network is uniquely positioned in the gap between peace-building, mental health, and development or governance work, drawing on evidence of what works in each of these fields to deliver a powerful integrated approach. Welcome, Angie. We then have a group called Gateway Zimbabwe, and they, they have a few participants. So Gateway Zimbabwe is a collective of community leaders and institutions from the rights, social and ecological domains who are on a journey of exploring and socializing new and local pathways for generative dialogue to reweave and enliven the social fabric of Zimbabwe. Gateway Zimbabwe works at the intersection of spiritual ecology well-being and community to foster shared leadership and support the co-creation of community responses to complex challenges. Welcome to Gateway Zimbabwe team. And Non Kululeko has a very creative way of introducing herself. Um, could I let you do that uh, quickly now and then I will go to our questions. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Unum <laughs> Kululego. Um, the struggle that still emanates from my name. Born just a day after the first anniversary of the release of the man said to be the liberator of the oppressed, has me still feeling like my own liberation is still only buried within the confines of my name, Unum Kululego. As this freedom and peace is but a fantasy I have not lived to see, yet only continue to see bound by the shackles of only being fluent in the language of the oppressors while my own mother tongue was never breastfed to me as my parents concerned themselves with raising a child that could fit into the system rather than to raise one who could have more embrace for their own cultural identity. Going through years of a questionable identity has only seen my adulthood experience being strained by the consequences of my parents ill-informed choices, where I have now found myself finding more solace in tracking my ancestry through the dreams that once seemed to be a haunting experience, gradually becoming understood as communications from the spirits that still walk within and besides me on this earth, where the failure of pharmaceutical medications revealed that my healing would only stem from the beads and protective strings that needed to be strung around my waist, wrists, and ankles a practice which the colonizers still deem as a barbaric display of witchcraft. I have learned that my upbringing became too Eurocentricized when I began to find my footing in my Africanness. It felt like a return to a home I had longed so tirelessly for, a home I wish many so will someday return to in order to begin the true healing that we keep seeking the healing of a gravely distorted being that cannot identify with self outside of the construct that has been tailored to have them fit in rather than to always seek to stand out and stand up for all they were, they were through their forefathers and all they were destined to be, a people of Africa that may live to someday enjoy in Gululego, which is freedom. Thank you. Wow, so incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, absolutely, we, we dream of that. So thank you very, very much. Um, okay, I will be directing questions to different people. Um, but as I said, please add to the, the panel as, you, as you'd like, um, if you have something to say. So the first question I'm going to be asking Sumaya, please, to to um, give us a response to this. Um, the first question is, continuous traumatic stress, which is a concept or a diagnosis that we are seeing um, that is the norm in African societies. How is it possible for individuals to function and contribute to their societies, which are also possibly traumatized? How do you see us doing this? Thank you, Susan. Um, I mean, it's quite a difficult, you know, question because one of the things uh, when I'd done the research was around how do we engage with the different aspects 
um, that individuals are facing, which is their trauma experiences and the mental and emotional impact. But then there's also this social environment that they engage with and which in turn re-traumatizes um, based on experiences and the research focused on migrant groups, but we're also seeing it around other vulnerable, vulnerable groups, especially with regards to um, the gender-based violence situation that we're having. So as I thought about this question, um, I really thought around what Jada had said earlier that the deepest trauma in Africa is one of poverty. And we face a number of, you know, just structural and systemic levels of, of violence and dysfunction, which in turn feed into our societies. They feed into our families. They feed into the spaces we, um, you know, individuals are in. And so with that, and then thinking around how do these individuals who, you know, kind of you, you think about this little ball and all these um, kind of trauma effects in a sense feeding into that ball and how do we navigate ourselves in those spaces? How do we still function? How do we still contribute to those spaces? And one is that we need to look at structural, systemic, economic change to let that ball look a bit different. And I think there's a number of challenges with regards to that. There's a number of pe people have been trying to do that. Different programs have been trying to do that. And so there's a number of challenges with that. Uh, and so the fight continues. I think in terms of the work that we're doing at CSER and the different organizations um, that have worked with MHPSS that I've interviewed for the research, one of the things that has really strongly come out to assist is to really not be looking at the individuals that we work with as victims or survivors and, and this labeling that goes with that. Or as we know, you know, with programs, you have the statement of vulnerable groups, the LGBTIQ+, that's the group I'm working with, or we work with torture survivors but the essence to acknowledge an individual as a human being. And what we found in that is then when you're having a conversation with the organization that provides social assistance, or you're having a conversation with the organization that's going to you know, assist them with schooling or help them with food vouchers, we're not talking about this label, we are talking about a human being. And so I had a really um, good experience this week where I had a client who needed assistance and really, you know, experiencing a lot of challenges and struggling to function and, and struggling to contribute and saying, okay, how do I contribute as a mother? How do I contribute as um, a family member? How do I contribute as a community member? And having conversations with an organization around this mom and what this individual, who this individual is. It was really nice to get feedback then that she was no longer kind of seen as just a number or a category, but was actually seen as a human being and how resources then come in and be able to support individuals and that support. And I think it really speaks to our role in this society thing, where when you are able to contribute to that individual's well-being, watching how then it plays into other spaces where they are feeling a sense of acknowledgement, feeling a sense of I am a human being and yes, the system is against me in a number of ways, but there are spaces, spaces of hope, spaces where I can then, you know, kind of receive support and in turn, you know, they get that, it builds resilience, it builds a sense of hope to want to feed back into the society. I think it is very challenging. I think that we have a lot of work that still needs to be done and the task is huge but it really is looking at what are the, the pockets of hope? What are the spaces where we can engage? And I think community work, which has come across throughout the, the webinars is vital. Bringing communities together, really creating kind of that bottom up approach when there is a lot of pressure and a lot of difficulties that I experience from you know, the top down approach. Thank you, Susan, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Maya. Yes, um, we talk about it in Zimbabwe, creating pockets of safety or, or um, pockets for healing 
when the larger system at play is not willing or able to provide it. So thank you. And it just, it reminded me of um, a slide that Nam Funda from CSVR provided. And I think the first talk um, around leadership and the, how the society um, can become, is traumatized. And I think she's asked a question here. Um, there was a question and it's about, you know, most leaders immediately close their eyes when we talk about trauma, especially theirs. What are creative ways of reaching leaders and those in power? How, how do we drop the medical nature of the trauma conversation into the one that pulls the leaders in? Um, so I'm just uh, bringing people's awareness to the, the question and answer panel. Um, there's a question there around that as well. So please feel free to go and have a read. Some people have, have provided answers, very interesting. Um, thank you, Samaya. Great. The next question I'm going to direct to Charlotte, um, please. And this is, there is a need for marginalized groups such as migrants, members of the LGBTIQA plus community and persons living with disabilities to be better integrated into healing strategies. How do we do this when power asymmetries in communities are maintained through othering? So I'll give that over to you, please, Charlotte. Hi, thank you so much, Susan, for your question. Um, I think that issues of othering in particular speak to existing or underlying anxieties about people's own identities, the sense of safety and security, uh, questions around, do I belong? Where do I belong, right? And if I belong, why are my needs not met by those whom I belong to, right? And when we look at Africa, um, issues of fragmentation within communities are, are, are evident and it creates a distrust within and without uh, the community, right? And historically, if you can remember that uh, division was a weapon used to kind of divide and conquer the society, the African society, right? Uh, and so that um, they are fragmented into smaller groups. So according to the differences, right? So uh, throughout the, Afri the African landscape, there's this missing piece in peace processes, um, pun intended, uh, which speaks to restoring the community, restoring relationships. So these are just things that come off the top of my head as I'm thinking about this thing of othering. And there's a focus on the differences in the community. And I like what Sumeya just talked about, you know, the labels that we place on people. Sometimes they even impede on the access to, to help, access to services, because there's a certain label. And with that comes stereotypes, stigmas, discrimination, and all of that. But instead of of, of focusing on the on the differences as a negative, it's important. I find that to look at, at look, focus on the multiculturalism, right, where we focus on the, the 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 commonalities in our stories. When I think about issues of um, between, for example, migrants in South Africa and South African citizens, when you think of transgenerational trauma, uh, continuous uh, traumatic stress context. These are things that are common in the stories, right? And these are things that we can actually use to, to, to push a different kind of dialogue in the communities instead of focusing on what is it that is different or focusing on me and you um, as the in-group and the out-group. It's important that we focus on, we, we create more dialogues where we engage with these things that we have in common and looking backwards to how, how have we been affected by the same systems in the same way? And, and hopefully maybe uh, forging uh, a new generation of youth who are connected through the commonalities uh, within their communities and using the differences as a way to develop diverse solutions and, 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 and sharing of healing strategies within these different, these seemingly different communities, sharing the healing strategies forward. So I think it's it's really a, a as I, as I think uh, a few people have spoken about it, kind of changing the narrative and the focus and the doing away with the labels um, with regards to how how is it that we we we, we talk about about the community and 
are we focusing on the fragmentations? Are we focusing on the things that divide us? Or are we focusing on the things that bring us together? And it's not in a way of canceling out the differences to say we don't see the differences, no. It's using these differences in a positive way, in, 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 a, in a strengthening way. And I find that you know issues such as unity and diversity and Ubuntu have really lost meaning in our societies. And this may be largely due to the helplessness and fatigue from not having access to certain basic uh, resources and infrastructure. And this is another conversation on its own that speaks to accountability and so forth. But really, as, 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 as a kind of closing statement, it's important that we really to find ways that we can focus on, 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 on bringing together that which, bring, that, that which is common in the communities and hopefully use the differences to strengthen communities rather than divide the communities. Wow, thank you, Charlotte. That's thank really you, great. Yeah, celebrating the diversity um, and finding commonality. And I think leading on from the last conversation around, you know, different cultures use different things for healing. It may be dancing, it may be music, it may be drumming. Um, not, there's not going to be a one size fits all approach to healing when you, when we acknowledge this diversity that you're talking about. Um, but allowing people their own sense of agency um, with that identity when they, in a healing approach, but yes, not making it a discriminating point, being able to celebrate that diversity, learn from each other, um, see the strengths in those differences. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, if, if we have time at the end of this panel, um, people can answer questions across, across their groups, but just for uh, time's sake, we're gonna keep moving. So Dr. Angie, this next question is coming for you. And I know that you're multitasking, but thank you so much for being here with us. Your question, is accountability a prerequisite to healing? Does healing rely only on state acknowledgement of crimes and legal recourse? Is symbolic justice a valued and adequate form of justice and does it promote healing? I'll give you that first section to go with. Sure, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm in the back seat of the car. Um, I think I wanted to, like, um, Celeste, is, of course, um, who came right before me. As you said, it was Charlotte. As you came before me, said, let's start to reimagine what healing can be. And when we look at justice and accountability, we look at it at a dichotomy. And I'd rather look at it is can we have accountability and justice within the process of healing? And through that, I'd like to actually tell a story. And it's a true story that happened to us about eight years ago. Um, in Southern Somalia, there was a young Kenyan Somali. We thought he was just a Kenyan Somali. He, he really requested, he wanted to become a trauma healer and go off to his, his, his home village in Somalia and take trauma healing to them. And we were excited, we trained him, he was part of the facilitation team. And he kept saying, but we have to go to our village, my village, my family's village. And so we said, finally, okay, we're, we've got it set up. We're going to go and do the session in your village. You'll be one of the facilitators. Um, and as we got there, all of a sudden, it's like he almost went pale. He couldn't actually, um, function anymore and the team that was with him said it was like he was sweating and they're like does he have malaria does he have dengue what is wrong because he somehow something is not right here with him but the first day he was almost silent and yet he had been really really harassing people that they had to come to this village and he really wanted to do it um, and on the second day about midday he finally stood up and at that point, we had just looked at the cycles of violence, of hurting self, and how victims eventually feel the revenge to hurt others. And he stood up and he said very clearly, I must tell you something, I have a confession. I didn't come here as a trauma healer today. 
and my name is. And at that point, he gave his three names instead of the two names he gave at the very beginning. And the moment he gave his three names, my team who was there said, the room stopped. Everyone stopped breathing. You could feel the tension in the air. And this young man said, you know why I've come here today? Because you know, 20 years ago, what happened to my family and where my father and my uncles lay buried in that mass grave. And he pointed to where the mass grave was. And as he did this, he, he was shaking. The whole room was tense. And he said, but I didn't come, I actually am not going to do what I plan to do. I am going to actually see if we can make peace because one day in 20 years, my son will be sitting here waiting for you to come back to avenge the killings that I do here today. And at that moment, an old man in the very back stood up and he said, you know who I am? I am the one who led that event. I am the person who was in charge that night. But for the last 20 years, I've had no peace. For the last 20 years, I have actually had no sleep. I have nightmares. My wives have all left me. <laughs> My children have forsaken me. I have nothing. So if you're here to kill me, I think it would be best because if this could end it, then we can end it. And the young man said, no, we learned the cycle of violence. It doesn't end here. It would continue. So let's end it. And at that point, the traditional um, hair system jumped in. The dias were negotiated. The families from Kenya who were refugees and in and, and living in Kenya, they came home after 20 years. Their property, their land was returned. Eight years today, they're living at peace together. They're, mar they're intermarrying, they're cousins basically. But they are now in a point and a place where peace has come, justice was served, but there was no ICC tribunal. There was nobody but themselves who through a healing process found their justice, but also found their peace. And in the end, they agreed what the truth was because everyone knew what it was, but they approached it from healing. So I think I leave it with that story. Wow, what an incredible story and outcome. Um, thank you. And showing the power of restorative practices and um, cultural practices in restoring the social fabric. So yes, I will not add to that either. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, let's move along. We've got two left. And this, the next question is to the Gateway Zimbabwe team. I'm not sure whoever speaks on your behalf, please introduce yourself, um, give us your name. I will ask you the first part of this question. Um, and then, and we've got about just less than 15 minutes, just over 10 minutes for you and another um, person to speak. So if we're just mindful of that, your question is how then does healing take place when trauma treatment does not encompass all the levels of traumatization? especially in contexts where there is a lack of adequate victim support systems or reparation mechanisms. Over to you, Gateway Zimbabwe. Thank you so much, Susan. My name is Tendi Sai Chukadere from Gateway Zimbabwe. I come from an organization called Trust Africa, which one is one of the three institutions, which is part of the collective. And I think as I think about this question, uh, even weaving through the threads that have come throughout the other um, panelists as well, you know, at Gateway, our inquiry has really been focused on listening and sensing, which is often a counterintuitive practice of slowing down and not necessarily looking to rescue or look for points of trauma or even points of healing, but really listening deeply to the soul. And for us, it's become the circle practice of beginning with individuals rippling out to collective community listening and then rippling out to an ecosystem listening. And for us in that journey of listening, you know, we're accompanying and being with communities as well as individuals in ways that offer different gateways for this listening. 
And what we're discovering and continuing to inquire about is that the deep accompaniment with these communities in inner work practices, in new ways of bringing the community together, participatory, um, creative expression, and also bringing these now to strengthening the, the ecosystem has opened up possibilities um, and allowed us to sojourn with these different circles, you know, from the individual community to the ecosystem through all that is present. And for us, that means from the past, the present and the emerging future. And it allows us to move from a place of making projects of communities, uh, projects for healing, projects for you know, trauma-informed practices, projects for whatever you want to call it, and really being with these communities. And for us, of course, I think this goes back to the point from Numfundo in one of the earlier practices. This is where we really reconnect to that sense of, of woundedness, you know, and particularly in a context like Zimbabwe with this continuous traumatic stress. Thank you so much, Sumeya. That's one of my favorite new terms now that you brought it into the webinar we are on together. <laughs> you know, leaves many in Zimbabwe as crawling wounded or if they're lucky, walking wounded, you know? And even as Karis was alluding to you, the normalization of this abnormality. Um, and the more and more that we're noticing the frozenness from this wounding as if communities are stuck in time and unable to unfreeze to make movements that off ramp from the abnormality or make movements that are inclined towards health. So for us, this has led us to a second key insight that we have been um, inquiring around about developing practices that really support this awakening and movement towards health. And so this entry of listening has led us to an exploration of and a really rigorous dedication to practices that not only encourage this deep listening but also nurture wholeness. And in the webinar that we were on, you know, we talked about wholeness with the W and wholeness with just the H and being able to be with both of those wholeness. Um, and that process enabling some of the defrosting to continue. You know, I think for us as we're creating safe spaces for these practices in these circles, it's also been quite important. And I think it was Charlotte that was alluding to this as well. Um, and I think even Angie as well of creating containers as well for this. I think somebody had said something about um, who is, I think it was Celeste, who is caring for the carers, you know? And so for us, it's become very important about also creating the container that is also practicing and involved on a regularity and in a rigorous way in these practices themselves. And where is that container, as that container is held and these safe spaces are created, speaking the unspeakable, and feeling beyond the numbness is given space and time. And not only within a silo of trauma, but really as a process of noticing where both the shadow and the light can coexist side by side. And so I'll allow Jackie and Mayan, who are also from Gateway Zimbabwe to speak a little bit more to the practices and reflect on the body of practices that we've engaged to really bring about some of this defrosting and unfreezing um, that we've experienced. Jackie and Mayan. Jackie, do you, do you want to go? Do I go? <laughs> I, I can go. Um, yeah, I I want to just take a deep breath, actually, first. Whew, it's been a lot of voices, um, a lot of words, um, a lot of important things spoken here this afternoon, um, but almost too much. You know, we're trying to do so much, so much. And... Um, and so my sense of our work is that it's springing out of a growing trust in process and in deepening and in, um, in practice. Um, so we've spoken about the, the negative stereotypes about Africa, but one of, the, one of the stories of Africa is we are the mother continent. We are where it all began. And so um, we work with communities with um, uh, with fellows that we are accompanying um, to reconnect to nature, to reconnect to the land, to let the land hold us a little more deeply. For me, of everything you said, Tindasai, the most important thing is wholeness. So no matter how wounded, no matter how traumatized I am, there's still a wholeness, there's still an innate health that is in me. However, however contracted and even broken at some level it's been there's still something that's unbroken in the in the human spirit is our 
premise and belief. And so we work to uh, connect with that. So the land supports us, embodiment supports us, movement, dance, people have spoken about it, art, um, storytelling. Thank you, Angie, for your story. Storytelling, um, mindfulness practice. So this is something you do in the north. What, you know, what does it mean here in Zimbabwe, closing your eyes and focusing on your breath? And yet it works. So practices from all over the world and, um, and, and some work for some people and others work for other people. But what we're finding is that as we bring communities together to be in practice collectively, and we do more than that, but to be in practice collectively, some of that unfreezing that Sendasai was speaking about can begin to happen, some thawing and some coming back to a sense of wholeness. Um, I'm conscious we don't have a lot of time, so maybe the only other piece to speak in is as we meet them, with our assumption of their wholeness, with our assumption of their um, exquisite beauty, of their soul power, no matter how broken. As I meet you from that place, I allow some of that to wake. And so I, as a facilitator, need to be as a, as a community worker, as a whatever name you want to give me, I have to be awake to my own kind of soul connection so that I can meet you in yours. Um, and so, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I feel like there's a lot of work that's really deep rooted African medicine woman work that we are being called to do. And I assume also African medicine man work. And I, and I, I long for there to be more space for that in the, in the institutional um, landscape. So thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you so much. Because of time. And I, I just think that the way, I just think what, what I've heard right now between the three of us shows how we are now imbued in this kind of collective. We've almost said what each of us was thinking. So I think that that's part of our practice is in interrogating that, listening to each other and, and coming to a space of, of clarity. I added a little bit into the chat, but it's enough. My, my colleagues have spoken. Thank you so much, um, Gateway Zimbabwe team. Really, really special stuff going on there. Um, Thank you. So the last five minutes, I would like to give over to Non Kululeko. Maybe you have to give me training and how I say your name. It's so much more powerful when you say it. Um, but the last question, the last five minutes um, is for you. Please, please hear it is. Whilst there is a place for hope and its value cannot be easily negated, one has to grapple with the reality of the use of hope in systems that are sophisticated, organized, resourced, and armed. What is hope in the face of systematic violence and trauma? And I think leading nicely on from what Gateway Zimbabwe talked about this frozenness, how people feel helpless and frozen. You know, we're bringing in this concept of hope and what is it, how is it, um, is it even a possibility? Over to you, please. Thank you, Susan. Um, I believe that hope, particularly in the context of systematic violence and trauma, may not be a feeling that many Africans can directly resonate with. Um, and I say this because much of it continues to be trumped by a continuation of the oppressive treatment within systems, though it is a feeling that may be realized if one person's experience with trauma may bear direct relatability, but with a focus on the personal experience of the individual, as one cannot derive a process of healing tailored for themselves by simply adopting the measures that applied to the next person. And as Anya's story highlighted an important feature of healing needing to be a collective effort, it is a collective effort because at the end of the day, one person's um, negative impact does not just affect them alone, but it affects everyone collectively. And where optimism is diminished by contradictory actions, particularly within um, systems and organizations, it can only be communities unifying themselves to restore the spirit amongst each other. As this will foster a collective effort to realize what hope actually does entail for everyone, not just one person, because it is an optimism that 
by me sharing with you as one individual, it might have resonance with the, one, the next person who might not be able to be as vocal about it. But now, since you have spoken out about it, it is a seed that you have now planted in someone else that they might not have actually been aware of at the time. And, but while it may be a focus on the collective, it's also necessary to commence, particularly at the individual level, as this is how it is possible to begin healing from within to extend this outwardly to others. And as Charlotte made mention of the diminishing presence of Ubuntu, it has never been a more opportune time to seek the restoration of this process as a lived reality and not just the word we have being thrown around circumstantially when it's needed for us to hear or be reminded of what Ubuntu even is. Ubuntu is not something we need to be asking what it even is. It is a practice that we should be instilling within our lives on a daily basis. Now, where hope is often used to simply garner the interests of the concerned individuals in most systems as a means to often blindside them, this is where you often see a lack of accountability being prevalent, as there is no way of directing grievances of false hope to systems and organizations that are meant to bear the responsibility of ensuring that these cycles of systemic violence and trauma are not further perpetuated to compound on the negative aspects that we know often from a lack of that accountability. And for us as individuals who are seekers of this restoration of a people who are not just damaged by their systems, such platforms that are provided, um, for example, by the CSVR, these need to be more widespread as the continuous raising of this plight for healing will, much like that of hope, eventually become more inclusive within our dialogue and reality as well. And accountability in this regard is particularly necessitated by the need to have people realize that their desires can be realized, though it is just unfortunate that this does not become the case because of the self-serving interests that we often see spilling over within our systems. And I believe that at, at, I also just wanted to add um, from a previous speaker's point um, from the healing of the self. I'm sorry, I just didn't quite hear when we had the platform open to us. Um, and it also actually ties in well with this is that our healing can only begin once we understand the pain that we are carrying around. And while some of it may not be immediately known to us, when we begin the quest of understanding ourselves, we start to unpack and realize what pain and suffering we carry and we seek to release in the process. So thank you very much. Wow, great. Um, I'm so glad this is recorded. I think some of that will have to be, have to sink in and go back over. So amazing. Um, and thank you for showing us the two parts, you know, the individual, the collective um, that goes there. So thank you. And I just want to read um, from another perspective from Gateway Zimbabwe, um, that they, we have a mentor who fervently negates the attachment to hope. And while this is quite drastic, it has reoriented our lens of shifting from outward search for the resilience needed to develop new ways to a sense of co-creating the reality aspired to as individuals and in what Meg calls islands of sanity. And in Gateway Zimbabwe, we try to connect these communities of sanity to ripple outwards to an ecosystem of sanity and health. So another take there um, on hope. Um, thank you so much. We're actually out of time for this panel. Um, we could have gone on, but thank you so much to our speakers for your very informed um, answers. And I'm going to hand over to the last uh, panel now. I think it's Gugu taking over. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan, um, and thank you to panel two. I think what I'm, like, I love language, I love words, and that was some of the most beautiful language and words um, and ideas that I've, that I've heard. Um, so when we met with the, with the moderators, I, I said my favorite phrase is, we're going to flow like water. And we've had to flow like water quite a bit um, in this webinar. We've lost uh, Google because of load shedding and we've lost one of the French interpreters because of load shedding. Um, so unfortunately 
uh, I'm going to step in uh, for, on behalf of Google for, for this panel. Um, but in our absence, let me just tell you a little bit about Google. Um, so Google Namaswas is a trained social worker and senior mental health and psychosocial professional with 13 years experience working in the mental health sector with a focus on rehabilitation and redress for those who are impacted by human rights violations such as wars, conflict, torture and other gross human rights violations and the resulting impacts of such on the overall mental well-being of individuals, families, groups and communities. And the panel that Google uh, would have been moderating is Mental Health in Africa, where do we go from here? In no particular order, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, we have Amina Mwaikambo, who's a psychologist and a mental health practitioner at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. We also have Boniface and Jeresa Betty, who is a Kenyan multidisciplinary practitioner working at the intersection between the arts, trauma healing and peace building. He's working with the Green Street Network as a senior program manager. GSN's work is currently being implemented in Kenya and South Sudan. Bonface um, holds a BA in communication from Daystar University in Kenya and a master's degree in peace and conflict studies from the University of Manitoba in Canada. Is a co-author of a journal article entitled Forum Theatre for Conflict Transformation in East Africa, The Domain of the Possible. Then we have Professor Peace Kikua, who is an Associate Professor in Psychology at the University of the Witwatersrand. Her research interests include gender and sexuality, critical race theory, critical social psychology and teaching and learning. She's a current chair of the Sexuality and Gender Division of the Psychological Psychology Society of South Africa. We also have Lulama Nkosi, who is the author of a book called Awkward, which details a journey of living with an autoimmune disease, mental health difficulties, and the subsequent tensions she experienced in her Christian walk. She is currently a third year student majoring in economics and mathematics, and is also passionate about promoting education and healthy environments for learning. We have Mariama Joberte, who is the CS CEO of an organization called Fantanka in the Gambia. She has a master's degree in sexual and reproductive health studies, which included gender relations and research. As part of a BSc in public health, she also has she has also studied psychology and sociology. Mariama also has expertise in sexual and gender-based violence awareness as well as years of experience providing mental health and psychosocial support to victims and survivors of trauma. As part of her work at Fantanka, Mariama supports and guides mental health and psychosocial support initiatives and training for the organization. She also works at the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission in the Gambia, where she provides mental health and psychosocial support to victims of SGBV, torture, unlawful detention, arbitrary arrests, amongst others. Finally, we have Alex Kigoa, who is the program manager at the African Centre for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims, a non-government organisation that provides holistic services to survivors of torture in Uganda. He's a graduate, nurse and manager with 10 years of experience working with survivors of trauma resulting from torture and other forms of violence. And he's passionate about cause um, change in lives of the most marginalized persons, including those with mental illness. So welcome to all of our panelists. For this panel, I'm going to be um, asking three questions and the questions are open for anybody to respond to. Um, so please feel free just to, to let me know um, if you'd like to respond to any of these. The first one is, what does the decolonization of healing entail? 
What does the decolonization of healing entail? Would anybody want to tackle that? Um, I think I can uh, begin. Um, Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Celeste, for, for the introduction and uh, for the welcome. Um, and thank you to the other panelists that have been um, very active ever since we began. I think uh, there's a, there has been a lot actually to learn, to take in, and also giving this uh, um, painting that, uh, the, the picture of Africa as a country of hope, uh, as a continent of hope. Um, I, I think it's something that uh, we really, really need to, to put into consideration, uh, build on that and be able to, to move forward. And also inculcates in us um, the possibilities um, and use of opportunities that are really, really available to us so that we can have um, the, 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 the the, the troubles that we have suffered uh, for, a long uh, for a long time, we can be able to tackle them and move forward and uh, have a, a prosperous um, Africa. When you say, um, what does the colonization um, um, entail, of healing entail? And to me, um, I want to understand uh, first what is the decolonization. And when I was reflecting on it and trying to to, to, to read about it and it came to me that uh, this is dismantling a process where you dismantle colonization, um, uh, the, the colonial tendencies. And this one would include uh, institutional, cultural uh, forces, um, power, um, and that have existed ever since um, um, uh, the post-independence um, uh, time. And when you look at the word dismantling uh, uh, colonial power, which is structural, so it comes to what can we do in terms of healing to dismantle this kind of uh, power that is structural, that is hidden into our cultures. And a lot goes to, it can be divided into two levels uh, in my thinking, we can have the thinking at the individual level, and but also at the structure and system, at the system level, institutional level. There's a tendency that uh, has been, uh, that we have carried as uh, Africans uh, and many people, that whatever that is African, it is evil. Whatever that uh, an, an African uh, tries to think about, uh, it has to be negative which I think it's not true. And this is the kind of um, uh, dismantling that we need to do. We need to rethink, we need to restructure our thinking so that we can be able to appreciate the African initiatives. Right away from the first panel, we have seen that Africa is really endowed in knowledge uh, and has a, a lot of uh, practices that are really, really positive and can really, uh, um, um, serve as a positive gateway to healing. But many times when we try to focus into that line, when we try to even um, people talk about them, they are seen as a negative force, as seen as uh, 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 evil people, as uh, seen as people who really don't uh, reason. And probably it, it can be also rooted into how Africans we have been able to build um, our science. Many times uh, the outsiders have failed to understand our way of doing science. Our science has been so much uh, cultured into the perspective of nature, into the, persp uh, the perspective of the religiosity, which probably may, not, may, may seem to be somehow different from what the modernization, what the colonial uh, time, uh, people have presumed to be science. So if we are supposed, if we are to really look at uh, decolonizing um, healing in Africa, 
first of all, we need to look at restructuring our thinking. And then when we do that, then we shall be able to also influence systems so that systems can be able to embrace the Africanism, embrace um, the indigenous uh, methods that have been existing for a long time, people, which people have believed in, which people have used, because we have a lot of uh, methods that have been tested, uh, people that have trusted for a long time and have served a purpose uh, to, to, to cause healing. So that's where it has to start, the restructuring of our thinking and then be able to influence uh, our systems to embrace uh, African way of, uh, of healing. Thank you, Alex. Anyone else? Hello. Um, Angelo Lama. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It's such um, a great um, platform to be on and listening to all the other um, panelists speak has been such a learning curve. Um, for me, decolonizing of healing entails um, firstly representation. I think one of the things that I learned, I think it was the fourth um, webinar, there was a, a conversation about, or a, a, there was someone presenting about um, storytelling and how that played such a huge part, a huge part in African um, well, culture and every day that there was storytelling of the hyenas and um, lion and, and so forth. And for me, that spoke a lot about um, how our healing or our um, trauma facilitation can involve us, meaning that to, to have representation, having people that sound like us, that look like us, um, that have our stories be the ones who facilitate um, the process of our healing because I can hear you and I can see you because you're familiar to me and you are speaking about things that are familiar to me as well. Um, and also to decolonizing um, healing also for me means that not only limiting, um, I think African people to what has been defined as African forms of healing. So even if we have um, Western ways of medication, for example, for me, it's, if someone has a, a heart attack anywhere in the world, there's only one way or a few, a number of ways to heal that person, but it's universal. But also redefining even the Western way of healing the mind or healing um, like in psychology, in, in a Western way that is also custom made to Africans. To not be limited to only, you know, Africans are meant to have this form of healing only, but to, to know that we, we live in a, we are part of a universal, you know, network. And therefore, in order for us to also function in that network, to also have the healing or the psychology of that network speak to us as well. And then also, um, it, mean, it means that reconciliation. So reconciling what, what colonization has done. So it's like looking back and saying, okay, um, when we have to decolonize something, it means that it was colonized before. And what has the colonization done? To go back there and say, okay, this is the hurt that has been caused by this. And how do we walk forward with that hurt and heal it instead of just leaving it in the past and just letting it sit and saying, okay, we're gonna decolonize everything without actually moving back and bring people forward um, like that. And then also redefining um, and also recognizing the pain. So I also know that a lot of African hurt and trauma is downplayed or um, like the magnitude is not recognized, like how big of an impact there has been. So decolonizing the healing means also allowing Africans to actually say what the hurt is like, the magnitude of the hurt to them so that it can be healed on their own terms. Um, so yeah, that, that is decolonizing healing for me. And also giving access to many different forms of 
um, healing, many different um, spaces for, for someone to heal. Um, being, for me, for example, being someone who um, struggled with an autoimmune disease as well as a mental um, um, health um, disorder, um, being able to have access to different spaces like um, a doctor, a psychiatrist, um, uh, a psychologist and so on, but also having a connection to, for example, my paternal family, which I never knew before and reconciling with them so that I'm able to know that there is a genetic mental illness in that part of the family. Again, going back to the storytelling in that um, decolonizing healing means that we are also reconnected to the places that we once lost in our lives um, because of all these other, or, or because of many different factors. Um, so yeah. Thanks so much, Dulama. I'm gonna ask Gugu uh, before her battery dies, just to say a few uh, remarks. Um, thank you, Celeste. I'm really so sad that this is happening to me this day. Um, but I think for me, this is quite, this is a subject that I'm very passionate about. Like for me, it speaks to ownership when I think about like who owns the healing process, who directs it, who, and who gets to say I'm hurt and my head looks this way. And I think in a, to a certain extent, we've sort of, as healers, we've, 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 we've we've got this role of being healers and we've taken charge of the process. But I think maybe decolonizing it may speak to us stepping back, like Lulama said, and let people define their own healing pathways. I'm a mental health professional and I, I, I dove in everything. Like I do a bit of upatha there by my uh, Zulu traditions. I go to church, I pray. I, I also know that <laughs> at times I've got my, I can go to a therapist and I can consult and I take all of those things. And that for me formulates and forms part of who I am as an African. My Africanness doesn't mean that I've thrown away everything that came, that, that is termed Western. Cause who says it is? Cause no one knows who does it belong to. Like it's just been framed in a certain way. And there's the, the love, there's been parts, I think, where we've allowed ourselves to, we've handed over. And maybe it speaks to the oppression that the first panel spoke about, the second. So that, that oppression and that frozenness that came from all the hurt that we have suffered as a continent has sort of led us, led us to this pathway where we've let go of our power. And for me, decolonizing healing means we get to drive the process and we get to be the lead, not be told that yes, because for me then that's like sort of like somebody who's like, you know, when a child, two kids are playing with a toy and the one child now says, yeah, you can have it. I don't want, I don't think that's what it means. It means us being the lead in taking back our power in our healing and where, how we want to drive the healing and where we want it to go. Like first, like being allowed to say, what does my head look like? Like, it may not be so significant for you. Like I've seen people who like, but I don't get it. Why? It happened a long time ago. Yeah, it didn't happen to you and that's okay. Let me hold on to it for as long as it serves me and allow me if I wanna wail and take off my clothes and you call that uncultured, but it's my way of healing. Allow me to express it in that way. And for me, those are the kinds of conversations that I feel like we need to be having as Africans who are taking the lead in our own process and, 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 and driving it and pushing it and, 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 and owning it and saying, this is where we stop, this is where we start, but allowing us to take it back and own it and move forward with it as we see fit. Thank you. Thanks, Coco. Um, I almost wish that we only had this one question uh, because we've got eight minutes <laughs> left. Uh, so Alex kind of touched on this when he was talking about we need to um, show our science and let people know what our science is. But the second question is, 
Given the complexity of the communities in Africa, how can we replicate indigenous and cultural treatment practices from one context to another? Because it, we are diverse. You know, people speak about Africa as if it's one country, but there's layers upon layers upon layers. Um, you know, so how do we now replicate some of these things, as Google was saying, that make sense to you? Um, someone else was also saying, these things make sense to Lulama. These things make sense to me and they work for me. So how do we replicate that into other contexts? Uh, I would like to make my contribution. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I want to believe that, uh, and I really want to pay due respect to uh, those who have presented ahead of me because there has been a lot of amazing contributions. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to talk from um, uh, my own experience and our own experience as Greenstring Network uh, from our research and practice, uh, where we have discovered that healing of individuals, uh, especially and also healing of collectives must be built on indigenous resources and cultures extant in the local communities, which is very critical. And what we have also discovered is that a lot of other models that have been used, especially the biomedical models of healing is that majority of them are not contextualized or they are replicating models of care or intervention that do not meet the needs of the locals or expectations of traumatized societies. Uh, and also, unfortunately, these models also blame, uh, their approaches blame local people for mental health challenges they experience without considering the structural, collective, or local dimension of these challenges. They block opportunities for communities to heal their, uh, to find their own solutions, to create their own solutions. And they trap individuals in labels without creating pathways for meaningful or long-term healing. So from this experience, uh, I want to say like, when you think about, you talk about replicating, then I think replicating might not necessarily work in this kind of context. Uh, but I think like my colleagues have already submitted their contributions. Decolonization is what is very critical because what trauma does is that trauma robs people of the creativity, the humanization and the agency. And when you think about agency, you are talking about which kind of agencies are we talking about? Because everybody talks about agency, but who is the agent? Who are the local agents? What is their story? What is their, the nature? Where are, they, where are they coming from? I think these are very important aspects. So if we answer those questions, then what it means is that people already know how to tap into their own healing. They, uh, they have agency to tap to drive their own healing agendas, which is very, very critical. All we should be asking ourselves is how can people rehumanize themselves? How can they reclaim their own human agency, especially from internalized oppression as we, we hear from writings of people like Franz Fanon and Paulo Freire. And then how do you create, how do you create social movements that are, that are rooted in healing, for example? How can we learn from the healing stories of other communities in Africa? How can we share these lessons as Africans? How can we learn from the resilience of our brothers and sisters from African contexts? I believe this is very, very critical uh, because there is opportunity for healing. There is resilience. Even if we have the story of colonization and oppression for so many generations, but there are also opportunities for healing in this, con in this continent. How can communities learn from one another across uh, different countries and across different regions, especially uh, what are the points of resilience that we can be able to tap into? Uh, how can we reclaim, how can we be able to strengthen ourselves from hearing the stories of our brothers from South Africa or the stories of our brothers from Ghana or the stories of our brothers from another South Sudan, for example? I think, what we have lacked in this context is those kind of learning experiences uh, so that we hear about the humanizing stories like Angie just told us a story about this young Somali uh, gentleman uh, who found healing for, the, for their context. These kind of stories needs to come out more often 
we need to have the everyday healers. All of us as everyday healers, we need to create kind of like an ecosystem of healing for lack of a better word. And also tapping into uh, our resilience for thousands of years in the face of oppression, you know? Right now, it's not just colonialism, like British colonialism or French colonialism or Belgian colonialism. It's also about neo-colonialism and globalization, for example. How are we dealing? How are states, newly independent African states dealing with, for example, the advent of neo-colonization, elite state capture, corruption of the state, which is traumatizing just like any other mental health issues. I believe these are aspects that we need to look into. For example, how can artists across the board be able to collect stories, create a container, an African container of stories of resilience and healing so that we can be able to gear our society towards healing, especially of intergenerational trauma. I think this is very, very critical. Thank you so much, uh, One Face. We've got six minutes left. Um, I'm in a piece, um, Mariama, any, any contributions around those two first questions? Should I move? Uh, I can say something, Ms. Celeste. Oh. Just quickly switch on my video here. Thanks, Peace, and then we'll go to Mariama after Peace. Thank you. Um, thank you, Celeste, and and I would like to to actually just echo my thoughts and and gratitude to not only the panelists on on this session but also the previous panelists. And I think my my really brief contribution to this idea of decolonizing healing and and thinking about replicability, I, I agree with the last two previous speakers that perhaps replicability is not what we need to be aiming for. And 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 to connect to your first question, Celeste, I, I think maybe our thinking around replicability is part of the work of decolonization of healing. So, so, so we're not thinking about trying to repeat um, and, and to, to have the practices of healing that look the same, but to rather pay attention to the particularities of different contexts. So to think about healing and, and interventions specific to the, to the context in, in which we work. The one thing I would also want to say is, uh, I agree with all of the speakers before who have talked about really creative and alternative forms of healing that include listening, uh, narrative, hope, and, and listening. But I would also just like to caution that part of the work of decolonization is that we can't afford an overly romanticization. And, and that means that we need to also think about the ways that decolonization is painful and has to be painful because the work that we're doing to echo Alex is that we're actually dismantling. And that's not easy. Um, it, it's not about, it's not just about dismantling social structures and institutional practices or histories of trauma. It, it, it's about also trying to think about the ways that we might have invested in these different practices as well. So it's, it's, it's a kind of rebuilding and reimagining of ourselves and ourselves in relation to others. And that's not an easy process. So I think the work of decolonization of healing is, is very necessary and needs to engage other ways of thinking about healing. Uh, but it is a very painful process, and, and it's it's a process that we need to be aware of in terms of that. Uh, the other thing I want I would really just like to say is thinking about this idea of of healing and and intervention. Um, for me, I think we also need to just try and think about other kinds of narratives that allow us to come and work into communities. So I, we, the one thing that we do share across the continent is a shared history of colonial and, and other kinds of trauma uh, and violence, but I don't think that needs to be our only entry point. Um, it, it is a very useful and, and necessary entry point, but it cannot be the only one. We need to think about ways of thinking about and talking about our context beyond just trauma and violence. I think we need to tap into other kinds of resources and narratives that allow us to reclaim. Um, so, so that would be my, my, my thinking around the decolonization of healing. 
Thanks so much, peace. Mariama, there's three minutes, two yeah. and a half. <laughs> yeah. I will wrap it up quickly. <laughs> yes, it's just the, um, my idea of this decolon decolon the decolonialization of healing. Um, uh, um, when we talk about decolonialization, we always think about the Western and whatnot. But in my opinion, we need to basically look at ourselves. You know, it's like decentralizing something instead of us you know, help us uh, trying to um, make people uh, take our ways. It's important to understand. Let's read and understand people's culture so we can basically um, send back or uh, help them in their own ways, support their family, support their communities to be able to support those people. Because um, uh, in my opinion, the help should be problem-centered. And to do that, families and communities are best at understanding what support you know their particular person needs for example you know but by doing that it's important to do research around you know um, uh, people's issues around you know uh, context to understand the context it's really important and uh, it's like when people are going to other places to find out their roots right it's important if you want to help somebody in a certain context or in a certain um, uh, surrounding, you must, you must make an effort to understand their culture, their background and everything. So, you know, I have a lot to say, but I'll just stop here. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Maria. So in the one minute, I do want to give it, uh, I mean, a chance to just say, oh, well, one or two minutes worth of, of remarks. Um, okay, thank you so much. I will try to just be a bit brief. Um, so, I mean, I think if we're speaking about decolonizing healing approaches, we need to also specify the decolonization of the learning of healing, of, of learning of healing approaches. And this speaks to the systems that govern learning and how they package healing and mental health. So we have to think about what mental health practitioners look like and how they sound like and how they've conscientized themselves about things like context and intersection and positionality in society. So, I mean, I'm here speaking as a black woman who's a psychologist who was born in Tanzania, raised in Swaziland, trained in South Africa, then meeting people from other spaces. And I've had to sit and reflect on what do I know about my clients? What do I know about the, the, where they're from, their history? What has brought them here? You know, I have to think about all of those things. I don't have necessarily, I can't necessarily come with the science that I received and then just take that and then put that in a therapy room or group space or in a community. You know, I have to think about my, my position as a practitioner. I have to think about my power. I have to think about my privilege. And I have to think about that whenever I think about the, the practice or the healing approach that I'm going to work with. And I think one of the discussions that have persisted is the Western versus the African or the Eastern, you know? And I always think about how, um, the people who wrote about the psyche didn't create it. It existed as human beings, you know, we are holistic. Um, we have a whole, we are a whole person, we have different do domains. So Freud might have written about it, but he did not create the human psyche. And I think that's important for us as Africans when we're thinking about how to continue with our healing approaches and what information we use to apply. We have to think about that and how much power we do have as Africans to understand the human psyche as well. You know, so um, I really think that in our now the way we understand personality, mood, and attachment will help us to also work with people and understand people who have experienced a lot of trauma. And kind of going back to like the learning institutions, I think which are very important important because they predominantly produce the mental health practitioners that we have today. You know, um, I think as Africans we have ongoing and persistent political issues things like war and torture, which have not ceased. I've heard people saying things like, where's their war in Africa? Where's the political conflict? It's there, you know, we're just so shielded um, because we might be in, in safer spaces that we don't understand, but there's still ongoing trauma that's happening because of so much violence that's happening on our continent. And I think in documenting our history and our current affairs, we don't always take that information into the learning spaces so while we're saying decolonize, 
we're not taking these experiences and putting the, them there and training people to understand mental health and trauma from that perspective as well. Thank you so much, Amina. And I'm so glad we gave you your, your minutes. Otherwise, you would have lost that. Um, this panel has been amazing. I have had goosebumps this entire webinar, but and this panel has really just excited me. Um, as someone said, I'm so glad we're recording this because we have to digest it. Um, Sonia, could you help us a little bit with your graphic to sort of seeing like where we started this, this conversation this afternoon and, and where we've ended? Um, because I, I know I need time to digest. You just muted at the moment. Um, okay, there we go, I'm unmuted now. Okay, can you all see? Yeah. And then can you see the whole graphic well in it? I think so. Okay, um, can you see? Yes, you can see. I think if, you, if everyone turns to speak of you, we'll be able to see uh, Sonia a lot better and we'll be able to see the whole graphic. I'll touch it through what I've got here. There's a lot, so I'll just sort of skim over. Um, but we start here with a history of torture, trauma, and violence. So here I'm really showing this kind of underlying basis of a capitalist system, uh, which is really fed by this kind of constant haves versus have nots control of resources, and that perpetuates the cycle of violence. And really, that poverty is one of these core traumas. And here we've really got around maybe for healing, Africa needs a system of sharing, which is based on African values. So really going back to the way it used to be. Um, here it's all, all around, um, can we see trauma before it escalates? And really owning that there's a lot of ignorance around what, you know, what trauma is. We, it's all around us and we don't see it. And we need to have more conversations, more social media, create more awareness around it. And then there's a big part around changing the narrative. So is it the dark continent? Or actually telling the truth, like what's really happening here? And using our many healing arts. So we've got dance, music, arts that are just built into the culture, that are ways of um, healing and speaking narrative and sharing and I guess expressing what Africa is. And here under torture and trauma rehabilitation Africa, here that there's a concept of continuous traumatic stress and individual is embedded in an environment, so traumatized and then continuously being traumatized in an environment. Um, and then I'm thinking that because it's systemic, healing is really a collective effort, but I also as an individual need to first understand my own pain. There's a piece around labeling, so where we other people versus where we see them as a real human being. And although there's a lot of diversity, we can look for what are the strengths of diversity and where is the commonality? So it's about restoring relationships. Then I clear we've got the gate of Zimbabwe, so we've got this practice of really deep listening and being fully with the system rather than sort of thinking we understand it. And being with the wholeness in terms of the woundedness and the wholeness, the, the fullness. And then we have practices that constantly help us move towards that wholeness. And, and unsticking the frozen stuckness um, and creating safe containers for that. And many practices hold that land, nature, dance, art, embodiment, mindfulness. And then there's a key piece as a healer, we meet other people with an assumption of the wholeness that's in them. And then they, that allows them to awaken to it. But to do that, we need to be in touch with the wholeness inside ourselves. And then the last piece is mental health in Africa. So here the decolonizing conversation, so we need to be able to dismantle the individual, the institutional, and that's a not easy, painful process. It's also about earning our, our healing processes, so that we express it on our own way, we can express the magnitude of it, that we can even um, recognize it, redefine it, and earn the pain that's there, as opposed to always just walking away from it. It's about representation, that healers look like me, sound like me, they hold my stories. Um, then tapping points of resilience, you know, what are the humanizing stories and um, creating containers for those stories. And then also ecosystems of everyday African healers. And so healers, 
they're everywhere. They're, they're, we're all learning to be that. Um, reclaiming my own agency from internalized oppression. Um, how, how are our healers and practitioners trained? Can we decolonize those systems? Um, and then that kind of conversation around rec 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 I can't even say the word. <laughs> rec replicating something. Um, that we need to understand it's the particularities of the context and so you can't just replicate stuff. And really, it's very context specific. And then a big piece is around taking our narratives beyond just trauma and violence. But there are other stories, there are other, there are other parts that, um, yeah, fill us and nourish us and pay attention to those stories as well. So that's what I've got for our harvest. And I will um, take a good quality photo and email that to you so you can send it out to everybody so you'll see it in more detail. Thank you so much, Sonia. I don't know how you're able to capture everything so beautifully and draw at the same time. Uh, it's not as skilled as I have. Um, I know we're over time, but I think it's so important just to say thank you to everybody, um, to Sonia for this amazing work, to every single panelist, moderator, and participant that started this journey with us in October. Just looking at this one graphic harvest um, and how deep and complex and exciting the conversations have been, I'm just ever grateful because it wouldn't be so rich if it wasn't for all of you. Um, for Jillian Skitter, who gave us those amazing videos, we really wanted to bring emotion to this webinar and, I, and we couldn't have done it without um, Jillian's work and the videos that we used to screen before each, each webinar. Um, to Romain and all of the interpreters that have helped us from October to now, Marcel, Piero, Thomas, Ashraf, Ramadan, Ivan, Julio, Faraja, Dowdy, Naliswat, Tusani, um, we will really value access and participation and inclusivity. And if we didn't have your help, that would not be able to be achieved. So we are so grateful for, for all that you do. Um, for the Praxis team, for Jatin and Mitesh, that, you know, we I'm so tech ignorant. Without them, there would be no webinar. Um, and for all the hours, especially that Mitesh has put in, for our donors, USAID and Dignity, for the CSVR team and all the hard work that they've put in, um, especially Gugu, Gugu N, Nanjingwa, um, who's been doing our media for us, even though it's not in her job description, uh, Anissa, Stephen, Sophia, Anna, and especially to Sumeya and Amina for all of their hard work. This would not have been possible without these two women, um, and we are so grateful. We're going to be sending you a lot more information, some infographics, some knowledge products, and information about follow-up webinars, especially about this decolonization piece and indigenous practices piece, which we think is so important. So thank you, everybody. Um, it was wonderful to have you, uh, and we look forward to meeting you in other spaces in the future. I'm so encouraged by the work that's happening on the continent, and I'm so grateful for the way you think and the way you work and the fact that we're moving we're moving in a very good direction. So thank you, everybody. And bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so bye. much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Hi everyone.